CLX webinar series, The Future of Technical Services. This is part two, titled Current Trends and New Skills in Technical Services. I'm Allison Armstrong, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Today, we have two presenters who are both active ELEX members. Our first presenter is Alyssa M. Gould, the Electronic Acquisitions and Serials Librarian at the University of Michigan Law Library, where she is responsible for the entire e-resources lifecycle. Previously, she worked as a cataloger in an academic library. Alyssa currently serves on the Committee on Cataloging, Description and Access, and as the LERTS Book Review Editor. Our second presenter is Erin E. Boyd, the Technical Services Supervisor at the Irving Texas Public Library, where she is responsible for overseeing all cataloging and processing. Previously, she worked as a cataloger in academic libraries. Erin currently serves as Director at Large on the ELEX Board of Directors and is the ELEX representative on the ALA Website Advisory Committee. I am joined by my co-host, Mary Beth Weber, the Head of Central Technical Services at Rutgers University. Mary Beth is the editor of the book, Rethinking Library Technical Services, Redefining Our Profession for the Future, in which our presenters for the series have chapters. At the end of Alyssa and Aaron's presentation, Mary Beth will have a conversation with them and will ask for audience participation. Then Mary Beth will facilitate a Q&A period of the webinar. There are a few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. All attendees are muted. If you have questions for Aaron or Alyssa, please type them into the questions box on your screen and they will answer them at the end of the presentation. We do not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to use Twitter to comment on today's presentation, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. However, we do not monitor the Twitter feed, so please use the question box to submit questions and comments. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides within two days. And now, here is Alyssa. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Hello, everyone. As Allison said, my name is Alyssa Gould. I am employed as the Electronic Acquisitions and Serials Librarian at the University of Michigan Law Library, where I'm responsible for all of the electronic resource lifecycle from ordering to cataloging and troubleshooting to analyzing usage statistics. Previously, I worked as a cataloger in a general academic library. Today's presentation is largely based on a chapter that Erin and I wrote for Mary Beth Weber's book, Rethinking Library Technical Services, published in 2015 by Roman and Littlefield. In particular, I'm pleased to speak with you today about current trends and skills for the future of technical services. I hope that what I have to share will spark ideas and conversation as we contemplate the future of our field of librarianship. To provide a little background, when using the term technical services, Aaron and I first thought of the different divisions and groups under the ELEX umbrella. While the current divisions are acquisitions, cataloging and metadata, collection management, continuing resources, and preservation, many other aspects of technical services work fit under these very large descriptive words. On the screen, you'll see a list of ELEX technical services related groups from today, and 10 years ago. Many of the group names have not changed, some have changed slightly, and some have disappeared altogether only to be replaced by something else. The term technical services can also change meaning based on your experience and where you work. For example, my institution does not have an official technical services unit. We have individual units for acquisitions, serials, and cataloging, but no one person oversees all three units. However, the term technical services still gets tossed around to easily refer to all three units collectively. You may have a similar situation at your library, or you might have the traditional technical services name, or even have a different name with even more functions than the ELEX umbrella includes. One thing is certain, very rarely does one technical services unit look exactly like another technical services unit, but the core goals of description and providing access seem to remain the same. 
So in light of what the term technical services encompasses, my co-author Aaron and I thought about previous transitions in the field when considering the skills needed for the future of technical services. Specifically, what allowed technical services to succeed during past times of change? And what can we learn from the past as we look to the future? Then we realized that changes in libraries are often begun by a change in technical services workflows. Think about the move from card catalogs to a computer catalog in the 1980s, or the implementation of AACR and MARC in the 1960s, or moving from firm orders to purchasing packages in the 90s to purchasing mostly online-only content today, and most recently, incorporating larger metadata creation roles and those include digital repositories, digital creation, and other opportunities. These changes impacted the entire library, yet they were often begun by an innovation in technical services that sought to enhance the library's mission to create access to information. As we look to the future, I am positive that many of the changes in librarianship will also begin in technical services. I want us to remember that we are well positioned to respond to and lead change in our library community. Many of these changes will mean that the definition of technical services will expand. I think we've seen evidence of this in recent years, specifically in the larger roles of metadata creation, as well as exploring linked data and BibFrame as a successor of MARC. So skills are obviously growing to match this expanded definition of technical services and will only continue to broaden as we go into the future. However, I want us to keep in mind that what makes us successful in the future of technical services isn't necessarily just technical abilities, but also our attitude and posture in the wake of change. This isn't to say that the importance of technical services, technical skills rather, is negated but that technical skills must work hand-in-hand hand with attitude in order for our area of librarianship to succeed. So the approach I have chosen to take when discussing skills for the future is to focus on how to determine what these skills are in our ever-evolving field of technical services, and then to discuss what attitudes will help us gain these skills over the course of our careers as we will have to adapt again and again. So first up, we'll explore technical skills. How do we know what skills are needed in the future? First, we can watch job postings. Even if you're not on the job market, watching the postings come through our various, watch the postings that come through our various everyday listservs. What skills are listed on these postings? Are there trends emerging across the postings? What skills seem important for you to develop so that you remain relevant as the technical services field evolves? Watching these patterns can help you determine when you need to add another skill to your proverbial toolkit. There are many research studies that have sought to discover exactly those skills that are most frequently included in job postings. At the end of my slides, I listed the studies and reports that I found most pertinent to our discussion today. Many of the skills listed in these postings are knowledge of non-marked metadata, including up to 15 different schemas, skills to work on digital projects, such as knowing how to construct taxonomies, analyze data, and contribute to the interoperability of metadata, experience with different acquisitions models, such as patron-driven, consortial, and also drafting RFPs, also knowledge of various programming and scripting languages, including things such as HTML, Java, PHP, Python, XML, using XSLT, and using APIs. Project management skills, also noted are knowledge of digital preservation systems, standards and best practices, knowledge of electronic resource management systems, and knowledge of authority control, among many others. However, these studies largely focus on cataloging and metadata librarians, and are not inclusive of all types of librarians within the realm of technical services. We have seen and can assume that the changes impacting the skills for catalogers are also true for anyone working in this field of librarianship as we are all impacted by each other's work. Something to also keep in mind while reading these studies are these questions. Did the employer actually find a candidate with these skills? And were the skills actually necessary to the position? A great research opportunity would to be to look into what skills were used one, five, and ten years ago on the job to determine if all the skills listed in the job posting were actually necessary. 
and that's something you can do in your own current position too. Another way we can determine the skills needed for the future is to look at our institutions, the place that you actually work at today. What projects are currently going on at your library? What projects are needed but haven't occurred yet? Where can technical services step in? And what skills are needed to make technical services successful in these projects? Also think about what skills do your systems need? How can you contribute to making your systems work for your institution? Some examples of these technical skills would be many of those listed earlier, especially programming and scripting languages, as well as knowledge of another metadata schema. Could one of those skills help your institution complete a project, like implementing an electronic resource management system, or digitizing and creating metadata for an online accessible photograph collection? Developing skills in these areas can contribute to your library's success. Often you just have to look around to see what they are. So now that we've explored what technical skills are necessary for the future of technical services, how do we get these skills? This is where the current trend of attitude comes into play. I think these are the attitudes we need to enable us to grow in our technical skills. First being creativity and collaboration and initiative. And then we also need some non-technical skills such as communication, time management, and continual education and learning. So let's run through these together. Creativity allows us to see solutions to problems that others may not see. It allows us to look at our library management system and say, we need the system to do this. If we try X, Y, and Z, I think we'll be able to get there. Collaboration also ties into creativity because we often can't solve a problem on our own even if we have the best idea for the solution. It lets us determine what people we need to include in order to have success in our own problem solving. Collaboration is also a big part of advocacy, which Aaron will talk about next. Third, initiative is the ultimate driver of gaining technical skills. It's our motivation to see a problem, envision a solution, gather the right people together, and learn new skills to reach a solution. Other skills we need, along with these attitudes, give us extra tools to reach our goals. Communication is essential to collaboration. If we don't have the ability to listen, explain, and problem solve, both verbally and in writing, we lose an essential part of our skills for the future. This is another skill that is also essential for advocacy. As Sylvia Hall Ellis notes, our 21st century participatory team environment in technical services departments support employers' requirements for individuals with above average interpersonal relationships with colleagues. This skill will make us more effective and ultimately more hireable. Time management is another skill needed, especially for the discipline of acquiring a new skill. If you're studying linked data or the encoded archival description standard or learning Perl, you'll need time management to balance completing your typical job tasks along with acquiring, practicing, and implementing a new skill. Among all these things, continual learning and education are essential to developing skills. I believe learning takes on many forms, whether it's from the informal conversations on listservs to the weeks-long skill courses offered by Alex, it's all learning. As we all work in libraries, a place that champions the human right to learn, I hope we embody this in our own lives and jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. So now, once we've learned what technical skills we need, and what attitudes and non-technical skills we can employ in order to learn those skills, what do we do? I think it's really important to continue the conversation. And by this, I mean that we should talk among ourselves. Let's share what we're seeing at our institutions. Together we can find commonalities and solutions that can help more of our colleagues than if we kept that information for ourselves. We should also share widely through written and spoken scholarship. Whether it's an informal e-forum setting, or writing a research article, or speaking during a webinar as we are today, there are many opportunities to share what we've learned. And don't forget that being in a conversation also means listening when our colleagues share what they've learned. Take some time each week to read your listservs and journals and chat with your coworkers in order to not miss out on the conversation. Also, don't forget to teach the future of technical services, the people. Let's teach our staff and our interns and our LIS students what we're seeing as necessary 
for the future of our field of librarianship. So, in conclusion, I realize I might have painted a broader picture of the skills needed for the future of technical services than you were expecting. In truth, things are changing so quickly that I could name one skill necessary for the future today and have it be out of date within weeks or months. Instead, I believe that if we each keep in touch with the current goings on of our field, the needs of our libraries, and meet each opportunity with an attitude of creativity, initiative, and collaboration, we will keep technical services a relevant and integral part of the library community. So thank you for your attention. And next up is Erin Boyd, my co-author. And you may experience a slight delay as we transition to her slides. Thank you again. Thank you, Alyssa, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Boyd, and I work as the Technical Services Supervisor at the Irving Public Library, where I'm responsible for supervising all cataloging, serials, and physical processing. Before I begin, I want to provide you with a little information about my library's technical services department and what my definition is of technical services. To me, technical services is the processes of acquiring, organizing, processing, and maintaining of library materials no matter the format. In my library, my, my department is called technical services. It encompasses acquisitions, cataloging, serials, physical processing and repairs, interlibrary loan, electronic resources, and systems. We work collaboratively with another library team for collection development, and staff and librarians from other areas of the library make purchasing, material purchasing decisions. My library continues the structure of traditional technical services work. As Alyssa stated at the beginning of the presentation, today's discussion is largely based on the chapter we co-authored in Rethinking Library Technical Services. I'll be concluding this afternoon's session addressing the topics of communication, collaboration, and advocacy. My hope is that our talking points will help to generate ideas and discussion about the direction of our ever-evolving field. To begin, I would like to discuss the importance of developing and strengthening the skills of communication and collaboration. Through strong lines of communication, we develop relationships with our colleagues. Improving our communication skills helps us to develop strong relationships with colleagues in and outside of our institution. As we move forward, I can see libraries participating in more cooperatives or consortiums, participating in collaborative cataloging, sharing resources, and expertise. Developing these relationships can also help us to articulate our needs. Strengthening these skills verbally and in writing will better equip us when we are negotiating contracts and licenses with vendors or working with public services departments to coordinate collection projects. Good communication equals good customer service. Sharing talents. Collaboration starts with relationships. So interacting with your community can bring these opportunities to light. By fostering a culture of collaboration, it can open us up to more opportunities to share our talents. For instance, cooperative agreements between libraries to share language expertise, cataloging, or electronic resources, which can be cost-effective solutions. Collaboration encourages open communication and involvement of all staff. We are all uniquely talented, so sharing our skills and talents strengthens our department and can help us to provide better quality services. Collaborative environments provide opportunities for training, allowing staff to develop their skills and knowledge. Problem solving. By working together, we can find ways to streamline processes and make better use of staff time and resources. It can expand our outreach and bring innovative approaches to daily, achieving daily activities. Lastly, when we work together as a team, we can only be stronger. Working collaboratively can also help us to avoid duplication of work and discover ways to provide better access to materials. Joining together can also build group support for issues or actions that we are currently facing. In the end, communication is essential for collaboration. All of this leads me to the topic of advocacy, which I find to be a rather timely topic. Right now, our community is making great strides in advocating our needs and the changes that need to be made to keep the library a growing organism. To start this topic, I would like to cover a few of the questions that Alyssa and I asked ourselves when we were trying to determine 
what advocacy meant to us, and ways in which we felt we could advocate for our profession. The first question I would like to pose is, what is advocacy? Merriam-Webster defines advocacy as public support for or recommendation of a particular cause or policy. So, what does advocacy for technical services mean? We feel this means supporting, recommending, or educating others about the various aspects of technical services work and how they impact the success of other library operations. Why is advocacy needed for technical services? Our interactions with our patron community is indirect, so it is not always understood what impact our responsibilities and job duties have to make the finished product, well, a finished product. Often reporting statistics of orders processed, copy, complex, and original cataloging records created, authority control updates, or preservation repairs each month may not yield the same impact as reporting the amount of in-person and virtual reference question answered. That being said, it is not all about statistics. At times, technical services is seen by the quantity of work produced, which is true. However, there is great value and quality behind those numbers. A great deal of training, communicating, and collaborating happens between each unit within technical services, which builds a better collection and a quality database. Our profession is very specialized and at times requires detailed processes. Much is involved in our work that it often goes overlooked by individuals outside of technical services. Our knowledge and skill base is far-reaching and encompasses knowledge from all aspects of the library, and a great deal of our work overlaps into other sectors. Administrators may overlook this fact by misunderstanding the significance or impact our department has on the overall operations of the library. We are all working to achieve the same mission, providing resources to our users. We just serve in different functions throughout the process. One example is expressing the importance of authority work. This is one area within technical services that cataloging staff and managers have remarked that administrators look to cut because they, administrators, do not fully understand its purpose. We know that without authority control, reference librarians, staff, and our users will not be able to accurately locate information in the online catalog if names, titles, subject headings are not properly linked and indexed within the database. This can also be said for vendor-provided records or shelf-ready materials. At my library, there are still times that we need to make adjustments to shelf-ready items. Why would I need to advocate? How do I get started? And what are some ways to advocate? As I previously stated, much of our work is indirect and the overall impact is not always understood. We need to communicate the extent of our work and its ripple effect across the library. We must advocate for our work because we can best define our functions and staffing needs. Promoting our work will help others to fully understand what our department contributes to the overall library operations and the resulting effects, if any, of these operations were to stop. This can also include serving on committees or working groups to hear concerns firsthand from other departments. We also need to advocate in times of change. Our field is constantly evolving to create new ways of handling emerging formats and redefining old practices, so we must be ready to communicate the importance and needs of these efforts and support needed to make this happen, whether that be funding, staffing, or equipment. For instance, the resources needed for preserving physical and digital content. With technology changing so quickly, we must continue to find ways to ensure access to these materials in the future. We must evaluate what software and hardware is needed, how we can move data into newer versions, and how we can continue to store this information. So how do we get started? First, you should determine 
how advocacy is defined, and what it means to you in your profession. For instance, what aspects of your work do you feel need additional explanation to make those outside of your department or the library field better understand the work you do? Second, determine where you should concentrate your efforts. The following questions are all things to consider when developing your own advocacy toolkit. Are you currently in the process of submitting a new budget with fund increase requests to be reviewed by city officials? Or are you seeking additional funding for a special project to your library administration? Do you have staff that need to go through additional training or workshops? Once you determine your audience, it will better prepare you for crafting your proposal. Lastly, you should develop an elevator or parking lot speech that quickly encompasses the importance of one's work. For those of you unfamiliar with these terms, they are a brief pitch, about 30 seconds, or the amount of time it would take riding an elevator or walking across a parking lot. That quickly demonstrates the importance of one's work. In essence, a quick way to communicate value. These speeches are an easy, to, easy tool to have to provide a short description of the work that is done, why it is important, and the overall impact that is the result of said work. For example, my name is Erin Boyd, and I'm the Technical Services Supervisor. I supervise all cataloging and processing handled by the library. This means that I'm responsible for ensuring that information is easy to access in the library's online catalog and that items are easy to locate within the building. My elevator speech was less than 20 seconds and it quickly illustrated my position and the impact it has on the library. Our terminology can get rather complex, so at times we must translate our duties into easy to understand terms, especially when dealing with individuals outside the field of librarianship. If you are looking for some examples, Alex has developed a list of elevator speeches to aid in creating your own. I've provided a link to this at the bottom of my slide. Now that you've developed your elevator speech, you may ask yourself, why would I need one of these speeches? Think of yourself as a library ambassador. Our impact on our customers is indirect, so having an established speech can quickly help you articulate the type of work handled by your department and its overall impact when dealing with administrators. There are several reasons why you might need to have one of these speeches prepared. To note, these advocacy efforts can be on a small or large scale. An example of small scale advocacy can be day-to-day -day interactions with staff outside of your department. Due to the evolution of our jobs, Many of us are involved in cross-training initiatives, so we may participate in some acquisitions or processing responsibilities or work assigned rotations at the information or circulation desks. Some of the best opportunities spring out of time spent during these cross-training sessions. They can provide a few moments of mutual advocacy efforts where you can develop partnerships, resolve issues, and most importantly, better understand other functions and workloads of the library. These interactions present a great way to open up a dialogue about the needs in both areas and to explain any processes or procedures that may seem confusing to a quote-unquote outsider. For instance, when RDA was implemented, there was significant training needed not just for technical services staff, but for, but for public services staff. Not only do we need to advocate the time needed for training to administration since operations would slow during this transition, but to our colleagues in public services so that we could prepare them to handle any pertinent changes in the online catalog. On a much larger scale, advocacy efforts can be driven through involvement in professional organizations. ALA and its many divisions, including ELEX, have committees they have developed that have developed advocacy resources, tools, training, and other educational materials to provide their members with information to help in their own advocacy efforts. Professional organizations are also places that can help bring us together to drive change, such as with the support behind the Library of Congress's proposal for non-political subject headings. 
technical services advocacy can also provide an opportunity to promote the need to have more tech services specific courses for LIS education to better prepare future MLS holders for positions within our field. To whom should one advocate? Anyone and everyone. Depending on your work environment, this could range from within your department, your library, administrators in and outside the library, friends of the library group, government officials, and so on. The sky is the limit as to whom we should advocate. How can we effectively partner with our communities? Collaboration and communication are a big part of advocacy. Once we can effectively communicate our needs, we can develop collaboration efforts within our organization and our community to build relationships and garner support. We must be available to answer questions, no matter how small. The end goal is to reach a common ground and understanding. Even the smallest efforts can yield big results. For example, there are several library interest groups that have built partnerships between libraries and vendors. For example, Alex has several interest groups that help to foster relationships and facilitate the sharing of ideas between these different groups. For instance, Publisher Vendor Library Relations Interest Group, the Acquisition Managers and Vendor Interest Group, and Collection Development Issues for the Practitioner Interest Group. The American Association of Law Libraries Technical Services Section also has a group, Vendor Supplied Records Advisory Working Group, whose mission is to provide outreach to vendors who produce bibliographic records, encouraging them to use established headings and standards. This group also reviews and evaluates these records to provide feedback to the vendor with recommended changes and revisions as appropriate. In conclusion, my end goal for today was to get technical services librarians and staff and MLIS students interested in our field talking about the value of our work and ways in which we can build a common ground with our colleagues to create a better understanding of the overall impact of our work. I hope that our talk has sparked some ideas and discussion and I look forward to hearing any feedback from you at the end of this program. I have listed some additional resources that I feel will be a good stepping stone in strengthening your skills of ad advocacy and developing your own elevator speech. ALA and its many divisions have worked to develop advocacy portals for each of its members to use. Before I close, I want to comment on the approach we took. We decided to focus on how to determine needed skills and what attitudes will help us gain these skills. This was also reflected in much of the literature we found in our research. Strengthening the soft skills of creativ creativity, collaboration, initiative, communication, time management, and continual learning can help us to focus on developing needed technical skills as we continue to adjust to our rapidly changing environment. Advocacy shouldn't be called a trend, yet it is one right now, and we should make sure it turns into a skill. We believe that technical services is far from dead. Technical services is the backbone of a library where everything starts and it is thriving more than ever. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now I'll turn things over to our facilitator, Mary Beth. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron and Alyssa for their presentations, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining me as well. Um, I'm Mary Beth Weber. I'm the head of Central Technical Services at Rutgers University Libraries. We have an unusual situation where we have Central Technical Services as well as distributed, but I won't get into that this afternoon. Um, as noted, I edited the book Rethinking Technical Services, Re Redesign Their Profession for the Future, which was published in 2015. The book consists of chapters that were written by a variety of people from various aspects of technical services work. Authors include early career librarians like Alyssa and Aaron, and as well as those who have long careers such as Sherry Vellucci, a former library school dean and a Best of Alerts award winner, and Sylvia Hall-Ellis, who 
Alyssa cited in her presentation, who is a well-known library science educator. The book concludes with interviews with a number of people, including current Alex president Norm Medeiros and ALA counselor Erica Findlay. The program planners had asked me to share my observations from the book, which I'll do briefly, followed by some questions from Alyssa and Aaron, and then there will be an opportunity for attendees to ask questions and um, to also respond to them. Okay, um, change is inevitable. There's no surprise here. We all know that it's inevitable. The difference is in how one anticipates it and handles it. This includes being proactive, being active professionally, as well as providing your input. Being professionally active isn't limited to attending conferences, and it can also be done to, through participation, uh, excuse me, participation in listserv discussions, providing feedback on standards, and sharing your expertise with others when resolving problems. Consider the positive side of change. Um, one of them is opportunity. A change can force us to re-examine and improve workflows. It can provide an opportunity for us to get into a new position to handle an emerging need, or it can also change one's career path. Changes can often have unanticipated as well as beneficial outcomes, such as enhancements to our library catalog or a much needed departmental reorganization. Another aspect of change is negotiation. The environment in which we work is becoming increasingly sophisticated. However, this also provides us with an opportunity to influence outcomes by participating in things such as standards reviews, customizing vendor offerings, etc. Um, vendors and other organizations, they need and value our input. We're in the best position to advocate for our needs. Um, avoid feeling that changes are forced on you and there's no recourse. Instead, ask and you might be surprised at the results. For example, when my institution undertook a PDA for computer science and math books back in 2001, ancient history I know, we did things such as negotiating specific parameters for the plan, including a higher number of uses before a uh, purchase was triggered. At that time, we'd asked for more than other customers had requested, and we ended up serving as a model for other institutions that wanted to implement a PDA. Another aspect of change is collaboration. Alyssa touched on collaboration, and I cannot stress this enough. As the liaison to public services and other departments in our libraries, at our institutions or in our communities, we're natural collaborators. Um, in a time of diminishing funding and when we're losing employee positions, collaboration is critical. No library has the funding or available staff to do everything. Collaboration allows us to share our strength for a positive outcome. And I want to note, too, that um, leaders and innovators often come from technical services. Uh, a little bit more in collaboration. Technical services personnel are active participants in other library processes, including public services and collection development. The choice of a discovery layer or new public catalog is relying on our expertise and input. Collection development decisions, such as PDA or DDA, require our active participation. I often use the term partner when I approach my non-technical services colleagues about collaborating with them. My goal is to be their partner as we plan for service to our users. Additionally, technical services personnel increasingly have more direct interaction with our user communities. We're no longer a backroom operation. This interaction can be through um, PDA or DDA requests or other requests to purchase materials. It could be through a library system that allows users to post questions. At my institution, it's called Ask a Librarian, but it's not staffed solely by librarians. Um, it could be through collaboration for digital projects, or it might be a consultation for preservation. It's a recognition of our expertise and an acknowledgement of our contributions to the effective operations of our libraries. We provide the support to make things possible. So no, technical services isn't dead, but instead is alive and thriving. Um, I want to talk a little bit about changing roles and needs. The role of libraries is changing and has done so in response to emerging needs. Recent changes include the provision of maker spaces, live chat for remote users, and a plethora of self-services. Um, these self-services haven't diminished the need for libraries or our support of these services. Our work and that of libraries overall continues to become more sophisticated as, de as demands increase. Libraries provide round-the-clock services such as databases, ebooks, or digital collections that require our support. There's less room for specialization, since we often have to do a little of everything. Um, for many of us, there's no longer a typical day because our work's so varied, and we have to switch our focus on short notice. Um, I sometimes use this example for my non-technical services colleagues. 
the workflow for ebooks is much more complicated than that for acquiring and cataloging a print book. With print, we select, order, and catalog the book. Once it's processed and sent to the shelves, we don't really monitor who has used it or how they've used it. With ebooks, the responsibility for acquiring, cataloging, and monitoring usage can be splintered among many people or departments within the library. Just ordering an ebook requires negotiation of license terms, including a number of simultaneous users, usage restrictions, swapping out titles, batch loading of record sets, perpetual access considerations, and monitoring turnaways. Um, while traditional technical services processes may no longer exist or may have been revised to meet changing needs, uh, examples of traditional processes would include things like serials check-in, uh, checking for call number duplication. There's definitely a need for technical services work, whether it's in a department that specifically named tech services or technical services work carried out within the library. Emerging needs require attention and problem-solving skills, and we need to make decisions about where to expend our time and effort. And this leads to my, my third bullet point. As my co-presenters noticed, the term technical services is subjective to interpretation. It can mean work or a department with that name. What's included in a technical services department varies, depending on factors such as the type of library, the size of the library, and its needs. In many cases, technical services includes cataloging and acquisitions. It can also include digital projects preservation and systems. New types of positions have been created to address emerging needs, including titles such as package coordinator, digital user experience librarian, and batch loading coordinator. Those are all new positions at my institution. And while technical services operations may be broken up and that work is divided among other departments in the library, the need for technical services processes such as acquisitions, resource description, authority control, and preservation are essential and will continue to be provided. And lastly, the last bullet I want to talk about is the open source factor. Um, the focus on open source products has had a big impact on our work. There are certainly benefits of open source, but it also requires a lot of work. Um, open source products, of course, may be free, but keep in mind that they still require time and effort, both of which could divert attention from other types of work. Um, when working with open source, weigh the benefits of a vendor-provided product against those of open source. Open source often provides viable options, but may work best for those who have the time to be an active participant in usability testing and development. Okay, let's see. Now at this point, um, we have some questions that I'd like to pose to Aaron and Alyssa, and also um, there will be a question too where we will ask for audience input. So the first question for Aaron and Alyssa is, in your opinion, what's the most significant development that's impacted technical services in the last five years? Uh, for me, Mary Beth, I would say that it's been the widespread acceptance and proliferation of electronic resources in all different formats that we've uh, been acquiring and cataloging and figuring out how to handle. I don't think we still have it 100% perfect, but um, I think the, the widespread availability of those would be the biggest thing for me. Erin? I echo the same sentiment of uh, e-content with how we're acquiring it, managing it, and maintaining it. Um, I'm still consider myself relatively new to the field, and since I began um, just a few years ago, it's been the impact and the shift of RDA and then the work being done with the Bib Frame initiative, the focus on trying to rein in our electronic and new digital environment. Okay. We also have some audience questions I was looking at. Um, let me see. Following up on that question, what changes or trends do you predict will take place in tech services in the next five to ten years? Well, it's hard to predict anything, um, yes, I but my, my best guess would be that we're going to see even more permeation of electronic resources in our workflows. I don't know about other institutions, but like as my introduction said, I am largely the only person who handles electronic, but we're starting to see it touching other units, and so I think um, we'll definitely see 
electronic resources, really getting into everyone's workflow. And it really kind of permeates the units and it gets rid of the silos, I think, that we've had in just our library organization. And so I think that as the tech services walls, quote unquote, are coming down unit-wise, I think it will continue to do that just by the type of materials we're now collecting. Okay. Now at this point, um, we do have a couple questions. And I mean, I have questions that I was going to ask, but I also wanted to um, preserve some time for answering audience questions. Would you be okay if we address some of those? Yes, let's do that. All right. Um, we have, it looks like a multi-part question from Cindy Harper, um, which is, I was hoping to hear something that would inform our library's decisions whether or not to further automate and outsource tech services work to vendor services. I work in a small library where the director is not pushed for automation. Um, she cites vendor records, Edifact, et etc. Part of it is the fear that automation would deprofessionalize technical services work, that it would cause administrators to push for staff reductions. My perception is that working with outsourced automated process, processes further deprofessionalizes work. What would Alex suggest to a library that has a choice? I mean, My I short answer something. would be it depends. Um, but I think it depends on a lot of things. It depends on your library patrons, what they need from the library, um, from your library's goals and missions, what you to say that you are going to do for your patrons. Um, I think you have to take a lot of that into account when you're thinking about sending work outside of the building. Um, Aaron, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree that it depends on uh, your library itself. And I know the topic of um, the deprofessionalization and uh, of the of our field and comes up as a concern quite often, but there's still going to be needed uh, staff uh, skills to control the materials that we are outsourcing and coming in, especially you know when we're doing stuff and batch batch loads and authority work, and um, there's still going to be that need for uh, staff to drive that technology. I just want to add to that that we get a lot of batch loaded record sets and that was our concern at first. Um, I used to always ask what do they look like, what did I have to do to them and it turns out that they require quite a bit of work. Um, the two people who handle them here, they have to use Mark Edit to do pre-processing, they do a lot of coordination with our systems department. Um, they develop scripts, they, they actually keep track of scripts they've used for various record sets and they also send out announcements as these record sets are added to the catalog. So some of our fears um, were not what we thought they would be. It actually um, is pretty sophisticated work. Okay. It's the same see. for my institution as well at my library that we use MarkEdit and, and we have staff that monitor and, and the same that you just said with your library. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Cam Yan Lee. Um, can you talk more about the challenges of um, managing open source resources? I can talk a little bit about our experience. Um, we have a locally developed and maintained metadata creation tool, and people will almost say, oh, well, it's free. Well, it's not really free because it takes so many people to um, manage it. Um, including the people who develop the metadata who are in my department. We have a whole group of programmers and we do usability testing that can take up to a month. Um, there's always bug resolution. Um, and I, I'm thinking more of open source on a local level. I know some people use open source and I, open source ILSs, which we looked into but we have not yet implemented. When I saw the um, open source topic, I actually first thought about um, like open resources, like open um, journals and whatnot, oh, things I'm that sorry. people are providing for, for free. But I was thinking too from the angle of electronic resources management, how hard it is to keep up with those things when they change and move websites and links don't work and things like that. So I think there's still the aspect of human time that goes into keeping up something like that when we're trying to provide access to either a product or um, a resource itself. So either way, I think the biggest challenge is the human time involved. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, and balancing it. Mm -hmm. Aaron, did you want to add anything? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have a question from 
I'm going to say Roman because we have a Roman here, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing the name correctly, um, who asks, can you elaborate on collaborative cataloging and provide an example of what that might look like? Erin, do you have something for this one? Well, a lot of what we're doing is with a shared database with OCLC where we're building records and sharing it with each other. And I believe there's some institutions that are pulling together resources for collection development um, and sharing those responsibilities across different institutions. Yeah, you're right about that. And too, I was thinking of um, uh, knowledge bases, and those seem to be becoming more popular with um, ILS systems that they're including a knowledge base. and our institution hasn't gotten to that point yet with our ILS, but I'm looking forward to seeing what that would provide for my electronic resource management tasks to see if that could help kind of crowdsource and have better information quicker for our patrons. Um, I'm in a consortium where we're actually developing a cooperative cataloging project for language expertise and where it's not so much a one-to-one. -one. For example, if I do 10 books for X library, they don't have to do 10 back. We did a survey of it, and um, we'll be doing the catalog in OCLC, and it'll be a way to get rid of some long-standing backlog, so I'm excited about that. But I can't provide too many more details now because it's just started. Okay, um, there's a message from Rachel. I'm going to move on to hers. And she asks, in your opinion, what are the top three ways we can help technical services staff to acquire the attitudes and soft skills you think we need for the future? I was just reading an article this morning by Sally Gibson. It's on my um, slides if anyone needs the exact citation, but she really advocated in there for um, involving all levels of staff in ideas for making processes better at your library um, and just saying how by just inviting that feedback and inviting the opportunity to maybe pilot or try something and giving them kind of the op permission to fail that through that she was finding that the staff of all levels really were being able to develop the creativity and the innovation to be able to um, just grow in those abilities just by giving permission and inviting that kind of culture and environment that that was naturally something that was being developed. I thought that was really cool. Erin, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more with what Alyssa said. Mm -hmm. um, she hit the so nail too. on the head. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to move on to John Reamer's question. He asks, regarding training, would you make a distinction between professional librarians and paraprofessional staff? Um, I just wanted to say a little bit based on my experiences here. I would not because um, we rely on everybody in our department. We do have um, our staff are classified, so they sometimes, and they belong to unions, sometimes are constrained by their classification levels. But with training, it goes back to sort of what Alyssa said. Um, there are some types of training where I invite everybody, even if it's not something that they're doing for their job, because it's something that they would benefit from knowing. Um, and everyone in my department has something to bring to it. They come from different types of backgrounds and bring different strengths. And um, we're so tightly staffed that we work very well as a team, so we, we really don't make a lot of distinction in our training. Yeah, I also agree that I don't think it's really necessary to provide a distinction. Maybe if it's some task that someone else actually doesn't need to know, but that's pretty rare that those things happen now. So I was kind of nodding along with everything you were saying, Mary Beth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have things that are FYIs, and if people don't want to go to them, fine. Erin, mm -hmm. I think I cut yeah. you off. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. It's the same with our library. We kind of roll it out through everyone in our department, and we uh, migrated to a new ILS. Um, I guess it's been, since 2014, so it's almost been two years, and most of the, the changes that we found and quick ways to um, try to achieve the same things we did in our old system were driven through staff and, you know, like Alyssa said, you know, given that open environment where everyone can kind of just test the waters and see um, having a just a, a widespread overall training for everyone, I think, is the most beneficial. Okay. Um, we have a question. Um, Following John's, what trends did you see in authority control? 
Well, I think it's going to be very important going forward with linked data and bib frame with the um, version of authority control with the URIs included with mm -hmm. the data. Um, I think that's going to be the, the most, I guess, the newest thing we're going to see in the, the very close future, I hope. I think more libraries might try experimenting with using vendors for outsourcing this. Um, we use a vendor here and outsource, you know, send files and then we have them loaded back in and we still review them, but at least we have kind of an intermediary that helps us to make sure everything is, is maintained. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have a question from Kenneth Harold, which is, um, what project management tools are you using due to these complexities we're facing? Well, I'll speak to that because I feel like handling electronic resources is very much project management with each mm -hmm. resource or each problem that I'm handling day to day. And I really, I don't have the best system down yet. So project management is something on my list to learn more about this year. But I do use a combination of spreadsheets to track where I am. And I've known people who use Trello boards to keep track of things. and. I think it's just a lot of experimentation to see what methods and systems work for you to keep things fresh in your mind as you're working on a project that expands for, for days or weeks or whatever, so you're not losing time as you're hopping around from project to project. So I don't have a perfect solution, but I would love to know if people have suggestions. Yeah, I agree. That is one area um, that I am still trying to work on is project management. I keep a lot of lists and logs and use spreadsheets to kind of document what, what I where I was and where I am now. And I know I have staff that use the um, the post-it notes that you can do use on your computer to kind of help segment things into groups so they can organize the tasks that they need to get done. We did use a commercial project management program. Um, it it was very complicated and we had a limited number of seats, meaning users, and it, it just didn't work out. But for our digital projects, we do use some open source product, products. We used to use something called Bugzilla. It was an error reporting system where people could send errors to different types of people if there was a bug in our software. And now we're using something called software.libraries where you can submit errors to a certain category or to a certain individual who has resolved them. But those last two, Bugzilla and software.libraries, we only use them for our digital library work. Okay, it looks like it's 2.57, and I know we're ending at 3, so at this time, um, I want to thank everyone for their questions, and I'm going to turn things over to um, my co-moderator, Alison Armstrong. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you all for for being here today. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable to us and will help, help us plan future Alex events. Alex offers certificates of attendance and digital badges for participants. Information on these will be in the email you receive. Thanks to Catherine Alec and Mary Reeder, Alex Tech Support, and Megan Doherty and Julie Reese with the Alex Office, as well as Mary Beth Weber for co-hosting with me. The support they provide will make it they make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. I also want to thank our presenters today. We have additional webinars coming up as well as web courses that are offered throughout the year, and we hope you'll participate in other continuing education offerings from Alex. Thank you for joining us.